Hello everybody and welcome to the SCP Iceberg. This is going to serve as both an introduction, or at least I'm going to try my best, if you're not familiar with SCPs, but it also has a lot of the very in-depth lore stuff that even me myself, considering to be like a huge SCP fan, didn't know a lot of this stuff going in. There have been other SCP Iceberg videos, however I haven't seen one over this particular one, and this one's by far my favorite because instead of just talking about weird one-off SCPs, it's like connections between characters and greater lore ideas and stuff like that. Also, if you're just interested in the Conspiracy Iceberg videos and wanna know where that's at, I'm recording that immediately after this, so hopefully it'll be up pretty soon. We've got a lot to get into, so without further ado, let's go ahead and do that. But as always, thank you for watching. I'm gonna give a brief rundown of the SCP Foundation and the basics of how it worked. That way, if you're not familiar with it, you'll know enough to at least get you Familiar enough for this iceberg. The SCP Foundation is a shadow organization that operates beyond the jurisdiction of any world government. They have one mission objective, and that is to secure anomalous entities, contain them by any means possible, and protect humanity from their consequences. These anomalous entities can be anything from traditional giant monsters and boogeymen, to three-dimensional rooms whose geometry doesn't make sense, on to old world gods that possess the future of humanity, buildings that go on forever and are controlled by one singular entity, even down to simple thought concepts that can erode the mind and break down the human psyche. The SCP Foundation specializes in containing all of these entities, however, above all else, it must maintain its secrecy to the public. The basic structure of the SCP Foundation works like this. You have your researchers who are the standard characters of every story. These are normally composed of doctors who have different level classification of what information they're allowed to know, who carry out their experiments and containment protocol for these anomalous entities. As you could imagine, with several of these creatures, especially the more physical ones, there needs to be some kind of strongman force in order to contain them or go out and recapture them, and that's where Mobile Task Force come in. There are several different kinds of Mobile Task Force in the SCP universe, or MTF units as they're called, but each one of them have their own specialization when it comes to what they do in the Foundation. Then all the way down at the bottom of the totem pole, you have D-Class. D-Class are essentially human guinea pigs. They are people that are thrown to some creatures in order to feed them or see what happens, and others are used for very tricky or risky experiments or cleanup procedures, and they're essentially treated like human meat for whatever creatures that the Foundation is dealing with. That should be enough information to get you ready for the first here. I will add that the reason I put a cognito hazard in this video is because several of these concepts, while fictitious, have to do with ideas of humanity and existence itself, so if that's something that bothers you, you may not want to be a part of this. I've seen a lot of people get really messed up by especially some of these later iceberg ideas, so just putting that out there now. We start with the shallow waters at tier 1, or as I'm going to call it, the D-class information. Most of this information is to get you familiar with the SCP Foundation itself, uh, starting off with the O5 Council. The O5 is a committee of 13 people whose identities have never been made known. They sit above the Foundation itself, and anything that happens within the Foundation goes through them. However, they are so secretive that researchers that are not above level 2 clearance are never even told that they exist. Several of the things that the O5 Council does is very shady and their morality is questionable at best. However, it's implied that they have knowledge that no other researcher does. Therefore, to question their actions doesn't really work considering how far ahead of the game they are. It's even applied that several members of the committee are anomalous themselves, uh, such as committee member one, codenamed the Founder, who supposedly has been around the f since the founding of the SCP Foundation, which depending on what tale you're using can be anywhere from the 1850s to King Solomon. So. Yeah, probably not a normal dude. D-Class are inmates is the rather well-known topic that the D-Class people, or as I said earlier, the human meat puppets, are sourced globally from death row and lifelong sentences and tend to be people who are in there for more violent crimes, such as murder and all that good stuff. While there are theories that this information is a lie by the Foundation to make people feel better, uh, it certainly works in most cases and makes you feel not as bad feeding, you know, serial killers to monsters instead of just regular Joes. Groups of interest is in reference to the several 
groups of interest that exist throughout the SCP lore. As you've probably figured out, more people than just the Foundation know that there are creatures that go bump in the night, and they have formed their own groups either to combat the Foundation or work against it in some way. These include the Church of the Broken God, which is a group that is made up of people who want to put together the pieces of their broken god to initiate essentially a return of their savior. The Chaos Insurgency, which is a group of people who stepped away from the SCP Foundation some time ago and created an entity with the sole purpose of destroying the Foundation. And Are We Cool Yet? Which is pretty much just a group of crazy weird artists who accidentally make or purposefully make anomalous things just to mess with the foundation. Undercover agents and private military funding. So as you could imagine another step forward, the foundation itself is implanted across world governments, whether that be the UN, private governments, or even local police population. This goes so much so that one of the aforementioned MTF teams I was speaking of is known as the damn feds. And their entire purpose is to insert themselves around federal governments around the world in order to figure out anomalous properties or blockade normal world governments from having access to them. Classification by ease of containment is actually something that people who are very familiar with the SCP Foundation have trouble with sometimes. There are three basic classifications for how SCPs work. These are the levels of safe, Euclid, and Keter. A lot of people want to associate that with the damage that these things can cause, but that's not at all what it means. Classifications are based on how hard it is to contain whatever entity we're referring to. For example, the locked box method is the best definition of it. If you can take one of these anomalous entities and put it in a box and nothing will happen, it doesn't matter if, if you take it out of the box, the whole world ends, if you can leave it there and nothing will change, then it's safe. If it requires regular maintenance, or if you're not exactly sure what will happen if you leave it in a box, but it will probably be okay if the box is strong enough, that would be Euclid. Or if it requires constant maintenance, it's constantly trying to break out of the box, something else is constantly trying to get into the box, and it requires around the clock care, it would be Keter. There are other like fringe ones, and some of them I'm even going to talk about in a minute, but those are the three basics. Also, I just realized this video serves as a really good introduction because I really want to make SCP content in the future. So I'll just send people here for any of that. So if you're from the future, hi. Fictional creative writing project, Duh. What is interesting about it though is how big this project is. Members from around the world with literally thousands of writers have come together on this one collective narrative to create new creatures and flesh out the world. While it may be confusing sometimes, it's created the largest collaborating writing project ever made. So good job everyone. So remember how a second ago I said there was only three and there's some extra other ones? Well this is one of those extra other ones. Thaumiel would be the classification if the entity itself is the box. What that means is sometimes certain SCPs are used to contain other SCPs. For example, if you had a room that if you were to go open the door on the other side of the room, you'd start where you began and the room forever loops on itself, that would be a really good place to store some big beast monster that you don't want to get out. Therefore, the room itself would be considered Thaumiel, since it's the box you're using to contain something else. Multiple cannons is one of the problems that you're going to run into whenever you have a writing project this big. Uh, basically, as you could imagine, there are several things that don't make sense if it's all one cannon. For example, a certain doctor can die in this story and then be a main character and one that comes after. So it's kind of up to reader interpretation if they want to believe everything and just say, oh, well, because reality got altered, blah, 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 this can change, or just do what I do and pick the ones you like. Multiple universes is very similar. Uh, there are listed extra universes in the SCP Foundation. For example, SCP-5000 is from a universe in which the SCP Foundation became evil and killed everyone on Earth. But this also makes a good explanation if you want to believe that everything's real and simply say, well, it's part of universe B or C or whatever have you. So SCPs are are numbered in this concept. Like I just said, there is an SCP-5000, and every number in between is a specific SCP itself. So one of the first questions you may ask yourself is, what's SCP number one? And that's a good question. The identity of SCP-1 has never been revealed. However, there have been several O-1 proposals, as they're called. According to the generally accepted canon, whatever SCP-01 is is so powerful 
that there have been several fake SCPs made in order to keep someone from figuring out what the truth is. You're gonna see later, but there's a lot of disinfo in the entire foundation. To combat this, several of the main doctors within the SCP Foundation have created their own narrative of what SCP-01 is, and you as the reader can decide whichever one's your favorite, that might as well be the real one. That leads us into The Factory. The Factory is Dr. Bright's proposal for the SCP-01. While the story is mostly told in a narrative, it talks about that the founder of the SCP Foundation in the early 1800s, along with several other people, discovered that there was a factory that was producing these anomalies. By using some form of matter, it was creating these supernatural objects that are seen later in the canon as different SCPs themselves. A lot of people like this one, uh, not only because it explains the origins of several SCPs, but it explains where the first member, or the founder as I mentioned earlier, of the O5 Council came from. That he was simply someone at this factory who was able to understand the supernatural because of his experiences. The Gate Guardian is another O1 proposal, and my personal favorite. The Gate Guardian is supposedly the angel that stands at guard at the Garden of Eden. According to the story for it, Solomon, way way back, went on a journey to find the Garden of Eden and came across the angel itself. The angel told Solomon one word, prepare, to which Solomon then decided to figure out the supernatural occurrences of the world and started the original SCP Foundation. I really like this one, not only because it makes the Foundation seem that much more ancient, but also because there's different entities in the SCP world such as Cain and Abel, who are both immortal, who have a great fear for this thing, and it makes sense that if their father was Adam, who was kicked out by the Gate Guardian, why they would be so afraid of it. Not only that, but imagining the organization as this ancient sort of secret society that's existed forever makes a lot more of the stories around the Foundation make sense. That is it for Tier 1. Uh, I hope you liked the appetizer, because now we're diving straight down into Tier 2, or as I'm calling it, the Mobile Task Force. First up, we have the Administrator. Now, this is a character whose existence is debatable. If they do exist, then they are the highest authority above the Foundation itself, above the O5 Council, above the Founder, everyone. They are mentioned in very few stories and by opposing forces to the SCP Foundation. However, the implications of it is that whatever the Administrator is, has either always existed or some form of deity. This is because of things like supposedly them seeing all of time forever, and the world around them being timeless and yada yada a lot of stuff they may or may not be real all right on to the first big one damarung damarung is german for twilight this concept is mentioned within scp 2718 and scp 3448 if you want to look into them yourself whatever this thing is it's established that the o5 council themselves are afraid of it i'll go ahead and say that 2718 is supposedly death itself and 3448 is a device that is used to communicate with people in the afterlife a short rundown of what happened is someone died and their body was placed in 3448 so they were able to communicate with the world behind them. What we get next is a very intense log of someone traveling through the afterlife experiencing all kinds of demons from locusts swarming them to the sky falling apart to all these ritual sites and essentially a description of someone walking through hell. Throughout the entire document the phrase belief is key is repeated over and over and at the end of the story you figure out that the O5 council themselves took amnestics which is something that erases your memory in order to forget about this entire situation. Now this concept doesn't make a lot of sense until you start to put the pieces together. One of the tags for this SCP is it's a cognito hazard, which means just knowing it exists is dangerous in itself. When you combine that when the phrase belief is key, this starts to make sense. We find out through the logs that the person who died in 3448 had heard these stories of what hell was like, and it's exactly what they experienced once they died. However, that's not because this is the one thing that happens. It's because whatever you think happens to you in the afterlife is what comes to be. So if you knew that this was how it worked, and therefore there is no true afterlife, then after you died, there would be no afterlife. 
This is why the O5 Council all took amnestics. That way, whatever they think the afterlife could be, it's better than nothingness. That's why the phrase belief is key is repeated so much. Whatever you believe eternity to be is what will happen. 231 is a bedtime story. Now, with several of these, there is this huge overarching lore that I can't go all the way into right now, and I highly encourage you to check it out yourself. However, I'm going to do a very condensed version of a lot of them, and this is one of those. Without explaining why, there is an entity in the SCP Foundation known as the Scarlet King. Supposedly, it's the god of another universe who is trying to break through to ours in order to control it. The Foundation was made aware of this after seven women were brought together in a ritual in order to try to bring the Scarlet King over, and instead they were each given a child to birth. And supposedly after the seventh child is born, that will break way and allow for the Scarlet King to pass into our universe. At the time of this writing, six of the seven women have already gave birth and then died immediately afterwards. While it's not specifically known what each of those children were, it's heavily implied that they may be SCPs themselves. So there's one girl left, uh, whatever is inside of her is a monster essentially, and as soon as she gives birth, an evil demon king is going to come into our world and destroy it. So the only way to prevent her from having this child and allowing the Scarlet King to cross through is she must be, according to an old legend, be tortured forever to prevent the coming of the child and therefore the Scarlet King can't cross over. This is known as the Montauk procedure and is necessary for the preservation of humanity. Now that's really dark, right? And it definitely is. However, there is an interesting twist on the story that came from the SCP tale by Faith alone. According to this, there is no torture procedure. What actually happens is every night the researchers come into her room, read her a bedtime story, and then leave. However, they persist rumors that she is being tortured in such a way, and it's horrible and gruesome, and everyone who's a part of it can't stand themselves, to create the belief that she is being tortured. And because this is like a god entity that must be worshipped, just because people believe that she is suffering, that's enough to prolong his coming. I really like this theory. It's an interesting take and a good example of how the Foundation will lie to other members of the Foundation in order to both preserve what little morality they have left and simultaneously save the world. Three Portlands is the same type of alternate dimension as 4971. And can I just say, I am so glad that it is worded the way that it is. This is how like all the icebergs need to be because when it's three words, and you've got to search the entire internet to figure out what it means. It's so annoying. Like, just, just say it, and it makes it so much better. So, thank you whoever made this. Three Portlands is a pocket dimension that can be found through entrances of both Portland, Maine, Portland, Oregon, and whatever the Portland in the UK is. It acts as its own city-state of people who understand the supernatural, and inside of Three Portlands, it is its own autonomous zone. 4971 is a shopping mall located somewhere in the US that upon entering it, people walk into a forest that they can never escape. Supposedly, this forest goes on forever. So this theory is saying that the Three Portland city-state is actually a forever existing infinite universe that these different Portland residents have simply come across. Or you can go a bit further with it and say the people in 4971, if they would just keep getting through the forest they find themselves in, which is hard considering it's full of monsters and other creepy things, would eventually find three Portlands and a means of safety. Reality bending is thaumaturgy. Thauma, th I tried. Thaumatur, that word is a way of saying sort of a slow burn magic. In other words, there are two main different kinds of magic in supernatural beliefs. The idea of invoking something all at once and then slowly creating an energy. The idea behind this is that several reality bending SCPs that we see are simply the result of a slow, slow burn or long built together energy. Tooth Fairy is SCP-478 and is an entity that resembles a small butterfly that flies into your mouth while you're sleeping and fills your mouth and lungs and stomach and all internal organs with teeth. So that's comforting. It's a good explanation of how ev several SCPs are adaptations of modern folklore. Here comes one I didn't know about until starting research for this, and that's SCP-000. Now, there shouldn't be a 000, and that's exactly right. 
The tale starts off with a security protocol in which a doctor known as Dr. Rosen is complaining that there is continuous error messages given from the 000 entry, which is empty like it's supposed to be. However, if you scroll down on the log and highlight the entire white area, you find hidden text of someone trapped in an alternate dimension. According to them, they continuously walk through this fog, and as they do, they see these different monsters and creatures passing them continuously. The only interaction they have that is in any way meaningful is a shadowy figure comes up to them and simply says the word foundation. In response to this, the person telling the story begins screaming as loud as they can, and as they do, they begin to see reverberations across the sky. They continuously scream over and over to see if something will happen, although nothing does. Supposedly, this screaming is causing the error messages that we are seeing on the 000 screen. This ties into an interesting theory, and that is that of pattern screamers, which the next topic on the iceberg is, pattern screamers. Pattern screamers are supposedly whatever existed in our universe before modern life existed and something caused them all to be done away with, although no one knows what. Pattern screamers are understood to be beings of pure energy that exist within the gaps of reality itself. What that means is they are both everywhere and nowhere at once, and whenever they scream, that's what causes anomalous things to happen, or reverberations in the world, and other spooky, scary, science wobbly stuff. So go back to the last topic, 000, and supposedly what we're seeing is what every pattern screamer themselves sees. And instead of being these evil entities that want to destroy humanity, they're simply people lost who can't find a way out. Or people, whatever existed before we did. Moving on. 001 is innocuous. This is a theory that has propped up. As I said, there have been several 01 proposals. If I am right, 30 of them. However, this theory says that all of those are wrong, and 001 is simply whatever the first SCP discovered is, and it might as well be a spoon that doesn't let you eat food or something boring like that. That would mean that every 01 proposal we've seen is simply a distraction in order to point people's attention somewhere else. Now we got a couple more of those weird object classes I talked about. First of which being explained. Explained is exactly what it says, that since this thing has come about, it has been explained in some regard, which makes sense if the foundation is very old. For example, one of the explained objects were these weird rocks that glowed green in the dark and caused physical damage to people around them, and we've since figured out that that's just radiation. Therefore, that is an explained SCP and is knocked off the list. Apollyon is another very rare class that you will almost never see. Going back to the whole box metaphor, uh, Apollyon is often the description that there is no box, or we have no understanding of how a box could exist to contain this. Or the description that I like, if you throw it in a box and then you're on fire and everything around you is on fire and the world is dead, it's Apollyon. Like I said, this is very rarely seen, for example, in SCP-4005, which is essentially a giant god that exists in an alternate dimension and supposedly at any time it wants could just destroy everything, that would be Apollyon. It's also seen in the SCP-01 proposal when day breaks, which is when the sun decides to melt everything <laughs> at once, uh, obviously can't be contained, and that is also considered Apollyon. Dr. Isabel Helga Antasia Parvati Wondertainment V is the modern heir to the Wondertainment Corporation. Wondertainment is a company you're going to see a lot if you get into SCPs. Essentially, as far as anyone knows, it is a toy making company that either accidentally or because they think it's funny, keep creating anomalous creatures. That's everything from people who speak in cryptic words to little toy robots that have actual nuclear missiles in them. Dr. Isabel, whose name is there, is the current heir of the Wondertainment Company. Now, really the only time she's mentioned is an SCP-5555, which adds a whole lot of lore for how the whole universe works. To make it simple, I guess, uh, the idea of the administrator, the person who sets above the foundation, is playing a universal game of chess against other different people in the SCP world, one of them being Dr. Isabel, the current head of Wondertainment. Supposedly, they play this game over and over, and this follows one of those weird canons you can believe that everything we're seeing is simply a game of these gods going back and forth with each other, and that the Wondertainment Corporation's one of the big players, and the administrators using the SCP as toys and 
blah 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 whatever while that gets into a lot of the whole extended lore of the scp universe uh, dr one wondertainment herself can be seen as simply the current dr wondertainment library of alexandria is in reference to scp 4001 also known as alexandria eternal supposedly after the original library of alexandria was destroyed in one of those ancient wars a new library of alexandria was made which had the sole purpose of creating these books supposedly forever every book inside of alexandria eternal is the entire story of someone's life the library itself is constantly writing in these books and whenever someone dies shuts it and places it on the shelf and the library is forever expanding allowing for more people to be created from foundation testing where they both tried to kill people who were alive and create new people by writing different things in the books. They discover that this library is not only a record of what's happened to everyone on Earth, but that it's also the causation of everyone that's happened on Earth. The theory is also one of the reasons I like the Gate Guardian 01 proposal so much, because if we think of the SCP Foundation going that far back in history, then the original library of Alexandria, whenever it was burned, caused a lot of people to die, according to this theory, and also brings up the idea that the original library of Alexandria could have been one of the first SCP sites. O5 are immortal, I've kind of alluded to earlier, just that the O5 can- Damn. Ow. O5 are immortal, I kind of alluded to earlier, just the idea that the O5 Council themselves are all immortal and have been here seemingly forever, which is proven by some of the logs and stories that they are mentioned in. Other theories go further and say that if we are in a cyclic time loop that is occurring over and over, then the O5 Council may be the only survivors who are aware of the loop itself which would explain why they tell the foundation a lot, but not everything. 399 is 239 is a really cool one that I'm gonna explain as quick as I can. SCP-239 was originally a bunker that was found a kilometer underground that no one in the foundation could remember why they built it. And the only thing found down there was the body of a man named James Talleran. Upon recovering the phone of James Talleran, he had written down everything that had happened to him, and it basically went like this. James Talleran was a research scientist who discovered an entity that was labeled as SCP-3999. However, for the researchers that are reading his phone, it doesn't make any sense because at the time there is no 3999. According to James Talleran, it was an entity that could not be described. It neither existed in our plane of existence, it had no physical form, and the only thing he knew about it is that it was this evil being that just wanted to torture him. At first, it started out kind of medial with changing things around his room to making people around him hate him, but it progressively got worse to the point that the SCP-399 deleted all records of itself and all records that James Talleran was a member of the Foundation. Obviously, this takes a lot of power for an extra-dimensional being to do all of this, uh, but its only interest seemed to be torturing James. It then began to get more malicious by having members of the Foundation murder his family and try to kill him, and it eventually got to the point where James spent millions of years, yes, millions, being constantly experiencing death and then being revived by this thing over and over. However, during this time, James realized that this wasn't actually happening and it was all a simulation 3999 had created in his head. Therefore, the only way to stop it was to kill himself, which during a moment of opportunity, James did. Which leads to where the story opens up of these men finding a bunker they can't remember, going down and finding the body of James. SCP-239 is known as the Child Witch. 239 is an eight-year-old girl who has supposedly infinite power. And by infinite, I mean according to the log, anything she has the will to do will happen. To combat this, the people in the Foundation told her she was a witch, meaning she thinks she can only perform a few spells that are given to her in a book, such as make oil into water and you can gently float off the bed and blah 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 because if she figures out she can do anything there's no telling what she'll do however after an incident in which she used her powers to kill a lot of people 
Dr. Clef came forward and decided to kill her through a manipulation tactic. After Dr. Clef killed her, she quite literally melted into the bed. This whole theory is wrapping around on itself that after this little girl was killed, she was able to escape her body and become a being outside of our realm of existence and then became the 3999 that was torturing Dr. Talleran. This is a cool way of combining the SCP universe, and especially because beings this powerful are rarely seen, it makes sense that one of them is just an out of body form of the other. All right, that was just tier two, y'all like that? <laughs> we are now on to tier three, which I've labeled the O5 Council. Speaking of Dr. Clef, Clef's goat daughter, Yes, I said that right. There are several odd doctors that exist throughout the foundation, and one of the most peculiar ones is that of Dr. Clef. According to what we know about him, Dr. Clef used to be in a sort of MTF unit that was on the ground hunting down SCPs. An event came in which Dr. Clef killed something known as the Goddess, but did not kill the goddess's daughter known as the offspring. The goddess itself was a forest god that appeared as a beautiful woman with horns and cloven feet. Some many years ago, Dr. Clef was lost in the woods, ran into this goddess, and they kissed, leading to the creation of the offspring. Yes, this deity's child is Dr. Clef's daughter, which explains the reason that Dr. Clef was so hesitant to kill the offspring after he had just killed the goddess. He then took the offspring to a Catholic convent and left it with a group of nuns because at the time it was seemingly just a normal girl. According to this whole legend, years later that child grew up to become SCP-166, also known as the Teenage Succubus. Well, what does SCP-166 do? Well, it is a young girl who is, at the time of the story's telling, 16 years old, I believe, who's been raised profoundly Catholic her entire life. However, because of her goddess nature, there's one catch. Any man who looks at 166 immediately becomes completely overtaken with the desire to kith her. So much so that the reason they found out about this is because the first time she ever interacted with a man who was a guy who broke into the convent some years ago, he killed four nuns in order to get to her before one of the nuns killed him. SCP-166 exists as a normal SCP in the Foundation. There's certain rules for her, like she can't touch clothing or else she gets burnt, she doesn't require food, and all of that good stuff, but what I really like about this series is it's again another way of tying in members of the universe to pre-existing SCPs. SCPs. Also, this makes sense because Dr. Clef is the only doctor that can look at her and not be overcome with that desire because if he did, uh, gross. Sheaf of Papers is the database, is referencing another O1 proposal. One of the O1 proposals is literally a stack of papers that on the top of it there is this invisible power that is writing new SCP entries. It's unknown if this stack of papers is causing the creature to come into existence or if it's just trying to warn people about what's to happen. Um, the Foundation's very afraid of it because if it's the former, then they can't stop it and it keeps making more. This theory says that what they're seeing is the writers online creating new SCPs and they're powerless to stop as we keep writing more of them into their universe. Gathering of a Hundred Spirits is the novel that gave inspiration to SCP-3117. 3117 is highly tied to the Global Occult Coalition. The Global Occult Coalition kind of exists as the mere antithesis to the SCP Foundation. Basically, 3117 works like this. There are these recurring dreams that keep happening to people whenever they consume random bits of media. This can be movies, music, whatever, but unknown hidden throughout the world are these different triggers that whenever someone comes across them they begin having recurring dreams of it or a hundred spirits all gathering together this is building up towards something that is only referred to as the monster shaped hole as it's said by people experiencing these dreams that imagine there is a hole that is slowly having pieces put together as people discover these secrets and eventually whenever you have a hole filled it's no longer a hole and just a thing it's an interesting concept that laid throughout the entire world are these invisible trip mines and that once all of them have been set up, whatever this thing is will come into fruition. O35 and the Jester is interesting. 
Those familiar with the SCP Foundation will know of SCP-35. It is a white mass that displays the sort of quintessential image of Greek comedy and will periodically switch over to tragedy. The mask will possess those nearby to put it on, and once it is on, the mask will communicate through their now lifeless body that's beginning to fastly decompose. The mask is a genius, has supposedly been around for the majority of recorded history, and tells stories, and has infinite knowledge seemingly, and can convince people to go insane, and in one case even caused a researcher to fall into a fit of tears and later kill themselves after just about five minutes of speaking. The Jester is a character mentioned in SCP Tales that is housed at the same site that SCP-35 is. The Jester is a person who was born with very odd genetic deformities, basically green skin and big yellow eyes, sort of like a frog person, who was a circus sideshow act who eventually was captured by the Foundation. Since this is pretty much just someone with a genetic abnormality, uh, they're allowed much more freedom around the site and even host comedy nights once a week. This is sort of a more light-hearted, jovial SCP, but what's interesting is the connection to 35. See, 35 can literally manipulate brainwaves to do whatever he wants, so it doesn't make sense why he doesn't just convince everyone in the room to free him or let him out. Unless he likes the Jester. According to this theory, the reason 35 hasn't destroyed the entirety of Site-19 and whatever else it wants to is because it enjoys having the gesture around or, in other words, enjoys the comedy that it was created for. This also adds the implication that if the gesture were to die, uh, a lot of bad things would happen, but we won't think about that. It's all happy good right now. Artistic Middle Finger is in reference to one storyline in which the entirety of the SCP Foundation is destroyed and it's up for all of the SCP's enemies to come together and eventually defeat, I believe it's the Scarlet King. One of the groups I mentioned earlier, Are We Cool Yet?, which is a group of like hippie retro artists, at the end of the story build a giant middle finger and point it towards a uh, god. <laughs> Containment Breach is a tale. Containment Breach is the thing that made the SCP Foundation a lot more famous than it previously was. It's a video game that was covered in Let's Players and Streams that chronicled this entire breakout of the Site-19 facility. Generally, this is accepted to be canon and that this actually happened and a lot of people died. However, the idea that it's a tale is saying that this is entirely a cautionary story that is told to members of the Foundation because if you ever let this happen, a lot of people are going to die. Monthly Termination Feeds Factory Earlier when I was talking about D-Class, I said that they were all inmates who were sourced together in order to be cannon fodder for whatever the Foundation needs. Well, supposedly, after a month of serving the Foundation, all of these D-Classes are just killed. According to this theory, the factory, which I mentioned in the beginning as an 01 proposal, is actually using these D-Class as the matter in order to create new SCP entities. Why the Foundation would be doing this is up to you. Maybe some of the things it creates are beneficial to the Foundation. However, this is a theory to explain what happens to all of these D-Class. Chess players for the legalization of marijuana is actually a joke, I'm pretty sure, because there is an organization in the SCP Foundation called Gamers Against Weed, which is a group of people who keep stealing like anomalous items from the Foundation because they think it's funny. So this Chess Players for the Legalization of Marijuana is just a joke on that. Pangloss is an old world god that is mentioned in the SCP universe as being the birth of essentially everything good. Supposedly Pangloss witnessed the first death and because of it wanted to bring positivity to the world. There are several notes that are found throughout SCP stories in which the SCP Foundation is encouraged to keep going and pressing on and other jokes that are sort of making jovial gestures to completely evil things that are happening saying that Pangloss is trying to make the best of a bad situation and that he is acting throughout several SCP stories even if we ever know it. The Feaster Bunny, while well, there's no specific SCP for it, from my information, someone from the SCP Wiki uh, was creating the Feaster Bunny as an SCP and then made it a skin in the video game Smite. Uh, so basically, it's like an almost SCP article got made into a Smite skin. And it got me thinking that for as many people are involved in this, the SCP Foundation is very rarely mentioned outside of its little bubble. 
and is basically one of the internet's best kept secrets. Secret Laboratory is canon, is like the antithesis of the containment breach is a tale. Uh, Secret Laboratory is an indie video game made about the SCP Foundation, and it's saying, well, if containment breach is canon, then this other video game could also be canon, so yeah. Mimetic formatting is in reference to the fact that several of these SCP logs themselves are formatted in such a way to either keep you from knowing what's going on, or in some cases kill you for looking at it. As I mentioned earlier, the Foundation does several things to keep even their employees unprivy to whatever's going on. So some of the actual formats of these pages are organized in such a way to confuse you or make you lose interest. Mr. Lie talks about 55. Mr. Lie or SCP-2284 is a person created by Dr. Wondertainment, which I mentioned earlier, whose ability is he can only speak in lies and anyone who hears him believes it to be the objective truth. So he could look you in the eye, tell you the sky is green, and you would immediately be like, oh, that's weird, why is the sky green? And that applies to everything. Using this ability, Mr. Lie was able to get very deep into the SCP Foundation, past a lot of people, and even change his own documents to say that he always tells the truth. SCP-55 is the unknowable entity. Basically, SCP-55 is placed in an SCP-55 containment chamber in the Foundation, and absolutely no one knows what's inside of it. People who built the containment can't remember why. People who walk in to look at it will take notes about what they saw, walk out, forget what they saw, and then all they would have written down would be scribbles. And whatever this SCP is, has the ability to make no one know anything about it. The closest they ever got was using a D-Class to walk in the room and communicate what it's not. The D-Class, while looking at it, did say that it is not a sphere. So, progress. So this theory creates a sort of paradox. If a creature that only speaks in lies were to tell you a lie about something that cannot be identified and you were to believe that lie to be the truth, then you would know something about the thing that cannot be known even if it's false and that would create a paradox on itself. Yeah, we're in the real big brain time now. UIU behind MK Ultra is in reference to the Unusual Incidents Unit, which is a group of the SCP Foundation who operates in the real world as a means of dispelling crowds or other different groups of people who have witnessed supernatural occurrences. And this is saying that MK Ultra was a thing that happened when an SCP of some sort interacted with the populace thought and that this part of the foundation simply came together to make people forget. The Arboro cycle is way too big to try to describe. Uh, to give the most basic of definitions, it describes the Global Occult Coalition or Chaos Insurgency, I can't remember which one, going through and killing every member of the O5 committee. At the end, there is a battle that is had between two big powers throughout the story, and supposedly at the end, the entire cycle repeats itself, going back to the beginning of the foundation. So cycle D implies that we are in the fourth turn of this cycle. This goes a step forward and says that the O5 committee are the only 13 people aware of this cycle and the only ones who try to prevent it from happening, hence why they all die and then everything repeats at the end. 407 is Yadelboth's voice. Yadelboth is a deity in Sarcasism and Gnosticism. While also having very close ties to the whole Cthulhu mythos, it is the idea of a creature that originally created life itself and was responsible for the first flora and fauna adaptations on Earth. In the SCP universe, it is the opposite of the Scarlet King, so much so that supposedly whenever someone dies, they either are snatched up by the Scarlet King or taken by Yadelboth. So what's 407? SCP-407 is a song in an unidentifiable language that is played through a tape recorder, and whenever someone hears it or is in proximity of it, they become these humanoid plant hybrids who all of a sudden have their cells molecularly changed to match that of trees and flowers and so forth. Supposedly, the reason this recording can't be identified is because it's Shadelboss' voice, and that the unbridled voice of the creator of life causes people to become different forms of life. Sword of the Believer relates to the Orboros cycle, which I talked about earlier. At the end, the two main characters face off with the Sword of the Believer and the Spear of the Non-Believer. The Spear of the Non-Believer is a spear that was used to stab Jesus' side on the cross, 
and the sword of the believer is lucifer's sword that he had when he was cast out of heaven so at the end of this fight you have the item that was used by someone that believes in god but defied him lucifer and the spear of someone who did not believe in god and tried to kill him the spear coming together in this final clash that resets the cycle of time so yeah the white queen is an adaptation of the character in scp lore known as the black queen dr gears is another one of the weird researchers who's mentioned several times throughout the series according to the multiverse uh things carry out slightly differently across universes however there's normal consistencies that are commonly seen one of them being that Dr. Gears has a daughter, that he leaves that daughter to join the Foundation, then that daughter comes to hunt him down, to either make him be her father, to get revenge, or to destroy the Foundation itself. This daughter is known as the Black Queen. The White Queen is a play on this, and supposedly in one universe there exists a version of Dr. Gears' daughter who is aware of the multiverse and that this is a completely senseless loop that keeps happening across timelines, and decides to manipulate that in order to destroy the foundation itself in some stories or in other theories destroy all the others and blah 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 it gets really confusing and like all these back and forth timelines but essentially a version of dr gear's daughter who has the power to manipulate multiverses Daleport is in a temporal loop, is in reference to the SCP known as Daleport. Daleport is an adaptation of the Lovecraftian story at the Mountain of Madness, and supposedly in the city of Daleport, a disaster that occurred that opened up a rift to the supernatural. Reading the logs of it as a researcher is going through and interacting with the city of Delport, the idea is that it is a time loop that is continuously happening on itself, which explains some of the anomalies that occur throughout the story. I'm actually going to link the Delport video by Volgun in the description because I think it's a really interesting one, so if you're into that, then I encourage you to check that out. Hidden text is what I mentioned earlier, that several of these SCP entries have actual hidden text in them that you either have to edit the page in some way to find or highlight blank space. A lot of the time, as with Damarung, which I mentioned earlier, this is because the information given is a cognito hazard. And in several cases, hidden texts exist in order to protect you, the reader. Unicorn Hair and Phoenix Feathers um, has to do with like SCP-4714, which is another Dr. Wondertainment product, and it is a small baby unicorn toy that has real unicorn hair. And whenever little girls brush it, they have the ability to make a wish, which as you can imagine, doesn't always turn out well. However, the implication that there is real unicorn hair and real phoenix feathers seen in the Foundation implies that way long ago in history, there was actual supernatural beings that existed among everyone else. However, I mean, with all the supernatural stuff seen in the universe, duh, I'd be surprised if there weren't unicorns. 4chan links is an interesting thing that happens with some of the log entries. See, if the SCP Foundation really does exist in our world and is secretive, then it makes sense that whenever something about them gets leaked, it's a big deal to the Foundation. Something that commonly happens in these logs is someone on 4chan will find information while one's being written, and then in real time the author of the page will edit it to mention the fact that information was leaked to 4chan, and it's sort of a cool way to make a real world ARG out of the foundation itself. 0513 refers to the 13th member of the 05 committee. Now the reason that it's so special is because 0513 doesn't exist, or at least doesn't exist all the time. In several stories it's mentioned that there's 12 members of the committee and sometimes there's 13. The idea behind it is that 13 is not actually a creature or entity, instead it is something that is summoned to either make decisions for the foundation or it exists outside of our plane of existence and drops in from time to time to help the committee. However, according to some theories, it could be the Scarlet King, it could be some other ethereal being acting outside of the foundation or even something like the white queen i mentioned earlier no one's for sure sidewide narrative deterioration uh, is in tune with the fact that as more writers get in on this project it becomes harder and harder to really understand what the true narrative is however the explanation for that in universe is that if we are nearing the end of a time loop or if the cycle itself is beginning to break apart then it makes sense that reality is not making sense in a lot of directions it's a really cool in-universe way of explaining why things are the way that they are. And with that, we are down to the final tier, known as Tier 4. I also want to bring in another theory that was not mentioned on the ice brew for this, so I've labeled Tier 4 the Ethics Committee. 
In the SCP Foundation, there is an ethics committee, which is normally the butt of a lot of jokes because one of the things the Foundation does in their free time is feed people to giant monsters. However, the theory is that the ethics committee is actually a facade for a true body that is acting within the SCP Foundation, either against or unknowingly to the O5 Council, and are the real ones calling the shots. First, we have multiple narratives. Um, again, as you've probably figured out at this point, narratives are very hard to point out. However, multiple narratives do make sense in universe if everyone has their own motives and can also be reality benders maybe a lot of what we're experiencing is itself the work of these greater deities or powerful entities creating their own narratives the way they want it to play out and these lead to the inevitable multiple apocalypses there are several scps that can theoretically end the world and as we've seen in several multiple universes in the scp foundation there are several that do end the world perhaps the entire thing the way that it's playing out is just a group of people, maybe the O5 or the Ethics Committee, trying to figure out how to avoid as many apocalypses as possible. Or maybe there's no point, and maybe everything that's happening within the Foundation is heading it towards an inevitable end. All SCP-001 entries are real, stating that everything, from the Gate Guardian to the Factory, to the fact that they are experiencing in their universe us creating more SCPs, is all true and the Foundation itself may be powerless to stop it all. The Foundation is real, it's stating that the SCP Foundation is its own shadow organization that exists within our real world. Or another theory, you are not. If the concepts that I've talked about at length before of I think, therefore I am, and our understanding of how the universe works to such a degree that just because we think ourselves conscious, we are not. However, if we are to think ourselves, and if I think, therefore I am, and if just thinking is enough to justify my own existence, then how is thinking about something else any different? If I am not real, and if the way that my thought process works, that I am creating my own entity and universe that I interact in, then by reading these stories, I am doing the same for it. To justify my own existence by my own thoughts is to justify the existence of my thoughts themselves. And the craziest thing? The SCP Foundation has even thought of this. Several theories and logs go at tandem, stating that perhaps it is all the imagination of a different person, and perhaps nothing that we know can be known for sure. And in that case, as always, what can we know? Well, that was fun. Now that you're all done with Existential Doom and Dread, and we have covered that, thank you for watching. I really want to get into SCP content, which is one of the main reasons I wanted to do this, because it's a good segue into that. And as I talk about the more obscure and strange SCPs that exist, I want to use this as sort of a fallback. And above all else, whoever you are, thank you for watching. Thank you to all of my subscribers, you all are the best. Thank you very much to all of my patrons, and a very, very huge thank you to my top tier patrons. Thank you, Kayla. Thank you, Pef. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you, Benjamin. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Publius. Thank you, Saucy. Thank you, Phasia. And thank you, Steven. All of your all support really does mean the most. Um, I literally couldn't be doing this without you guys, like watching how good the Star Wars Iceberg's doing, just something I wanted to do for fun, and people are watching it, and more people are subscribing, and it's, it's so insane to experience, and it's all thanks to you, and it really does mean the most. Thank you. As I mentioned earlier, the next Conspiracy Iceberg is coming out really, really soon. Once again, thank you for watching, and I will see you all in the next one. Bye!